waiting for Roger DeBerry to appear. As we talk about justification by faith alone, how is that compromised? <clears throat> It's a sacerdotalism and Romanism compromises it. What the meaning of regeneration means. Just waiting here. Said. Oh, there he is. Hello. Good morning, Roger. Hi. Let's open in prayer. Oh, God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed. Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, um, just a quick update on... Brett Murphy, that the battle is going on with the lawyers, which is why we've not heard anything. Um, whereas previous ministers like Arthur K. did not fight the thing legally, but just left, this is different. Murphy's got Christian concern backing him up. Good. So it's not going to be Panic alone issuing his sovereign ultimatums, but we'll see how it plays out. So that's an update. Plus, he just came off two weeks of paternity leave. Um, so he's very busy catching up. And then thirdly, why we've not heard anything is he's in the process of moving to his new house. And I guess buying a house in Britain is quite a significant issue with layers of bureaucracy. So just a few updates before we get started. Well, good for him. Pardon? Good for him. Yeah, so we may hear more yet. In the future on the Murphy case, we've kind of shifted away from that. It's been, well, close to 120 days, I think. Bennett just wanted it for the money, and he wanted to control a guy who, whose social media presence irritated him and irritated some of the Church of England listeners and so we'll, we'll we'll see where and we'll see if Fennec is brought to repentance for his maladministration his hostility his manipulation and it's and his doctrinal compromises that's all loaded things right there but if I might, can we get started back where we were yesterday and go to share? Yes, something? let's do that. Keeping the main thing, the main thing. Eric, can you see that? Yeah. We were in uh, the cannon's door, second and third head, corruption, black shoe. 
Um, I'll pick it up here to get us started. The true doctrine okay. having been explained, <coughs> Synod rejects these errors. So the rejection teach that it cannot properly be said that original sin in itself suffices to condemn the whole human race or to deserve temporal eternal punishment. And these contradict the apostle who declares, therefore as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death passed unto all men. Mm -hmm. All of sin. Romans 5 12. The judgment came one unto condemnation. Romans 5 16. And the wages of sin is death. That's a pretty strong, bold statement that these people reject original sin and its consequences of damnation. Yep. Um, there's a weakening right there. I saw a, a post yesterday by a conservative Anglican who wrote up the steps of the process of how heterodoxy on marriage enters into the church. And as he wrote this lengthy post, uh, I thought, and I may still write him and say, look, nice analysis, but the issue's a lot bigger than the, the, the gay sex marriage issue, far larger. Um, even though some of these conservative Anglicans are uniting around gay marriage, uh, non-gay marriage, LBGTism. Um, I don't think they're hitting the right topics. They should be hitting the, this entire topic right here and holding to the doctrine of original sin. Yeah, and, so there's a problem why they can't do that. There's a reason that they can't do that. It's because very few of them believe that Adam ever actually existed as recorded in the Bible. And it's because of the whole evolution thing, okay? So you'll find very few men who believe that Genesis 1 to 11 describes actual historical events. While it is perfectly clear that Paul did believe that it described historical events and the Lord Jesus himself believed that. So these people don't believe that, but they're also scared of being laughed at for being um, young earth literal literalists and so that is why it's very difficult for them to make an argument from original sin because we then have to affirm that we are all literally the children of adam who the same adam that was created in genesis 1 and 2 and that fell in genesis 3 so that makes it difficult for them i'm not saying it's excusable i'm, I'm sort of trying to explain it psychologically in their minds why they would find it very difficult to make an argument for original sin. And of course, having done that, you've chopped out the entire foundation of the Christian religion. You've got nothing to build it on. So their position is, in the end, actually indefensible. I'm talking about the conservatives. Because what is the foundation on the basis of their theology? They don't have one. For them, the Bible only starts in Genesis chapter 12. Are you still there, Donald?
I can't hear you. You are, you've gone completely silent. Can you hear me now? Okay, but yes, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. So I was saying, I wonder how Fennec, who denies the historicity of the early chapters of Genesis, believes in evolution, can relate to Romans 5, or does he, does the Church of England even care about R Romans 5? Well, you know, I've got uh, Tom Wright's commentary on Romans. Um, and I had a look at it the other day because I'm busy preaching through Romans at the minute. And he acknowledges that Paul believed that Adam was a literal historical person. But then he sort of talks around this subject by saying, well, you know, we need to find out what we think about that. And because we obviously don't think that, uh, we don't believe that Adam was a literal actual person. So we, we don't really know what to do with this passage now. Who, who is this person? Tom Wright. Tom Wright, okay. Yeah. So what happens when you throw out the historicity of the Bible is basically unique at yourself. It's a very serious statement by him. Speaking yeah. Yeah. He's quite clear that, that Paul does believe in a literal Adam and that the text makes that perfectly clear. And yes. he says, we know better. You know, we know better because we've got evolution. We know that the world is billions and billions of years old. Um, so we have to work out what to do with this text. Now, of course, they've been trying to answer that question since Darwin came out with his origin of species and they haven't come up with an answer yet. So that tells me they're not ever going to come up. But it also tells me that they're making theology up as they go. They have actually departed from the Christian religion because, you know, if you can't, if, if the house hasn't got a foundation, it can't stand. You can't build a house unless there is a foundation. And I think that is the fundamental problem with modern theology. Yeah, like my friend going on and on and on about monogamous marriage, with which I agree, but it's like he's fighting on the wrong battlefield. That's simply the effect. Yeah. Dealing with the cause. Yeah. That's right. So... You know, some of these American Episcopalians turned conservative Anglicans were all schooled in liberal schools where Graf Bellhausen rules, rules the day, where they have no confidence in the power and, in, and infallibility of Scripture. I think it's even worse than that. The truth is that they literally don't believe the Bible. If you can't if you can't say that Genesis 1 to 11 is historical and is intended to be read historically a you're either very stupid or you are illiterate or you're just an unbeliever now James Barr who was the Oxford professor of Old Testament and Hebrew back in the 80s actually wrote about this and he said he actually knew these evangelicals at the time who claimed that uh, Genesis 1 to 11 has to be read allegorically or poetically or something like that. And he absolutely despised the evangelicals of his generation because he said, the truth of the matter is that they agree with us, the liberals, um, that Genesis 1 to 11 is intended to be read historically. They know that perfectly well. And when they're with us in the guild, in the New Testament guild and in the Old Testament guild and in the Hebrew guild and in the Greek guild, 
They agree with us, but when they go back to their churches, they have to say that they believe that the Bible is the true and uninspired word of God. So they're actually lying to their churches. Now, this is James Barr, James B-A-R-R, and he, he writes about this in a book called Evangelicalism. And he had nothing but contempt for evangelicals who pretended that Genesis 1 to 11 is not meant to be read historically. Because he said, look, if you go to all the top universities in the world, Oxford and Cambridge are in the top five. I think the other three are Harvard, Yale, and MIT, or maybe, I don't know, some other university, American University. There isn't a single person there in the faculty of Hebrew and Old Testament who doesn't think that Genesis is intended to be taken historically. But they just know better because of modern science and modern knowledge. So the people who claim, the evangelicals who claim that the Bible is the word of God and Genesis 1 to 11 must be taken metaphorically or poetically or what, however it is, it mustn't be taken literally. At least in that original generation that James Barr was talking about, were actually lying. And he said this because he actually knew them personally. So he didn't like the lying. Yeah, he said these people, he said the bottom line is this. They claim to say that the whole of Genesis is the word of God. But the truth is that they have ceased to believe that it is. wonder who he was referring to. Well, it's the entire generation of British evangelicals that were alive in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Would Jim Packer be in that guild? I doubt it. Well, just, no, no. He was already in Canada. I think he left England in 1970, somewhere around there. <coughs> well, that's an interesting fruitful direction directly in contrast to the canons of Dort here. Yes. You see, I don't think there was anybody really in the church when these canons were written who doubted that Genesis 1 to 11 was historical. This is why it's important to read our enemies. You see, James Barr was by no means a Bible-believing Christian. Who's that? James Barr, the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament. And this is why it's important to read these people, because you find out very interesting facts by reading them. Don't just read the people that you agree with. You know, like you, you went to study at a Roman Catholic university for a year. You get some very good insights by listening to what our enemies have to say. Father Laser drifting off into uh, higher criticism of the Gospels. It yeah. Fun to watch. And I had my antenna up. Because I had done two years at Westminster, which specializes in forensic theology of liberalism, and I had uh, read pretty read everything Boltman wrote multiple times, and my professor had studied at Gottingen with Rudolf Boltman for a few classes. And as he said, actually, he said some good things. Then, of course, uh, his entire hermeneutic was anti-Christian, anti-Christ. Big statement, but I believe that. Well, let's press on. Um, if you can pick up number two, this is a rejection okay. of... So they condemn those who teach that the spiritual gifts or the good qualities and virtues, such as goodness, holiness, righteousness, could not belong to the will of man when he was first created, and that these, therefore, could not have been separated therefrom in the fall. 
For such is contrary to the description of the image of God, which the apostle gives in Ephesians 4.24, when he declares that it consists in righteousness and holiness, which undoubtedly belong to the will. Okay, what's, uh, what are they denying here? Goodness, righteousness, and holiness could not belong to the will of man. When he was first created, yeah. So but they're basically de denying that Adam was created good. Well, that's quite a new, a new, a new take. <laughs> I've not come across anybody who thought that. Or it's kind of creating a carve-out so that the will of man is not involved in the fall. That's the way I read it. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's probably it then. That's the view that Thomas Aquinas inclined to. Oh. Uh, will did not, was not negatively impacted, but that there's enough prevenient grace there so that the will is operational. And it's basically you come back to works salvation. Uh, of course. Do that. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I what they're rejecting here is that the fall include uh, what they are asserting is that the fall included will. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, number three, the, we reject those who teach that in spiritual death, the spiritual gifts are not separate from the will of man, since the will in itself has never been corrupted. There we go. There we go. But only hindered through the darkness of understanding and the irregularity of the affections. Trying to get that there. Oops, a little bit of. This is a 2000 page document we're working on. Um, that these hindrances have been removed. The will, like the baptismal juicing, the will can then bring into operation its native powers. That is, the will of itself is able to will of itself and to choose. Uh, there's a Anglo-Catholic friend of mine who makes a big deal of this point and yet claims that he holds to the 39 articles where Article 9, 10, and 11 make it clear that the will itself is fallen as well. Mm. So while on the one hand over here he's talking about free will, and over here he's talking about the 39 articles, I don't think he's thought very deeply about it. And yet proceeds with his Anglo-Catholicism. Mm. Uh, these guys, these ministers at the Synod of York were deep Bible-thinking men across the nations, Belgium, Netherlands. Some were snuck over to it from France, although they were prohibited from it. The English, mm -hmm. um, one or two Scots may have been there too. They were a Bible people, and I think that was a time when the Bible really, 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 really mattered. Yes. That's uh, right. Um, and they're way ahead of where many of our clergymen are today. I would venture to say that the Synod of Dort is not even studied carefully in the seminaries. We were we had it as a reference tool at Westminster, of course at Villanova, nothing with the Catholics. And the Reformed Episcopal Seminary for three years, not once. 
did Leonard Rich's ever exposit or coordinate this with the Synod of Dort or the Westminster Standards? He rarely referred, if ever, to the 39 articles or any of the confessions. He just came in and read Louis Burkhoff to us, got up and walked out. And he was not a good professor, although in his own mind he thought he was. Okay, so what's very clear is that all of these people who talk about the will in this way and the Anglo-Catholics are actually talking about a completely different religion from Christianity. We need to be clear in our own minds about this is that these people are not Christians. It's exactly as our homilies say. Anyone who opposes the righteousness of God that is offered, well, not offered, which is given to us as a free gift through the free mercy of God, is not to be counted as a Christian man, but as a promoter of man's vain glory. So they can use the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, they can use all the correct words, the cross, Jesus, the church, St. Paul, St. Peter, St. James, but they're talking about a different religion. It's not the same religion. Yeah, Christianity, Christianity is one thing. That's what Paul says. He says, look, if you guys are following a gospel that is not the one that I taught you, then you're accursed. Yep. And you've been deceived by the devil. And you're following a different God, a different Jesus. You have a different spirit and another gospel. It's very clear. There's only one gospel. There isn't a range of gospel, like flavors at a buffet. There's only one thing that is the real deal. That you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of the, of the cross alone. And that all of this is in the hands of the sovereign God. If that's not the gospel that you're proclaiming, I'm sorry, but you're not a Christian. Yeah, I, one, one of the fruits, one of the consequences of our work is my serious willingness to say of the Greeks and the Romanists that they're accursed. The theology, yes. that is. You know, I don't know who the elect are among them. Correct. Uh, and who's duped. Um, that's not for me to say, but as a theology per se, it's antichrist. All of this free will nonsense. You just have to ask yourself, if, if you're a proper, serious Christian, where is any of this mentioned in the Bible? All the stuff about free will and that our free will wasn't affected by the fall, this, that, and the other. Is there anybody who ever discusses any of these issues in the Bible at any point and at any time? And the answer is clearly no. These are things that have been made up by men. And very clever people like to talk about these things and to debate about them. But if you put the arguments to one side and you, and you open your Bible and you say, so where is it written here that man has free will? That the gospel is an offer that you are free to either accept or reject. Where is that actually written? It isn't written anywhere. What we find in the pages of the Bible is a different gospel from that. Yeah, that needs that to just, be stated. It's quite simple. Yep. This whole free will thing is noticeable by its utter absence from the pages of the scriptures. Yeah. Well, let me press on here. Uh, this is an innovation and an error intends to elevate the powers of the free will. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Erasmus did in his fight with Luther, contrary to the declaration of the prophet, the heart is deceitful above all things and exceedingly corrupt. And of Jeremiah 17, 9, and of the apostle among whom the sons of disobedience, we also once lived in the lusts of the flesh, 
doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, Ephesians 2.3. If you pick it up there, Roger. Okay. And we condemn those who teach that the unregenerate man is not really nor utterly dead in sin, nor destitute of all powers unto spiritual good, but that he can yet hunger and thirst after righteousness and life, and offer the sacrifice of a contrite and broken spirit, which is pleasing to God. For these are contrary to the express testimony of Scripture. There you go. These are contrary to the express testimony of Scripture. You, ye, you, you all were dead through trespasses and sin. Ephesians two, one and five, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart are only evil continually. Genesis six and verse five, and Genesis eight twenty one. Moreover, to hunger and thirst after deliverance from misery, and after life and to offer unto God the sacrifice of a broken spirit is peculiar to the regenerate and those that are called blessed. That's Psalm 51 um, and Matthew chapter 5. And we reject those <coughs> that the corrupt, the natural man can so well use the common grace by which they understand the light of nature or the gifts still left him after the fall that he can gradually gain by their good use a greater, namely the evangelical or saving grace and salvation itself. That in this way, God on his part shows himself ready to reveal Christ unto all men, since he applies to all sufficiently and efficiently the means necessary to conversion for the experience of all ages and the scriptures do both testify that this is untrue. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. Who in the generations gone by suffered all nations to walk in their own way? Acts 14, 16. And, and they, Paul and his companions, having been forbidden of the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia when they were come over against Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. Acts 16, 6 and 7. You want to pick up there or comment on anything there? No, that's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that God has chosen some and not others. He has chosen certain nations and not others. And that the term all men... And never ever means every individual. It simply means nations. It refers to groups of people, not to individuals. And that's just a basic fact of grammar, which a lot of people seem to have, a, have problems with, which is a bit disturbing. Okay. And we condemn those who teach that in the true conversion of man, no new qualities, powers, or gifts can be infused by God into the world. And that therefore faith through which we are first converted, and because of which we are called believers, is not a quality or gift infused by God, but only an act of man, and that it cannot be said to be a gift except in respect of the power to attain to this faith. Well, I don't know how that can be called a gift in that sense at all, in except in respect, in, in respect of the power to attain to this faith. If you attain to it through your own will, it's not a gift. For thereby they contradict the Holy Scriptures, which declare that God infuses new qualities of faith, of obedience, and of the consciousness of his love into our hearts. Um, Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law in their inward parts, and in their hearts will I write it. And I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, 
and streams upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. That's obviously the seed of Abraham. And the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So in other words, these things come from the Holy Spirit, not from our wills. This is also repugnant to the continuous practice of the church, which prays by the mouth of the prophet, turn now me, and I shall be turned. Yeah. Uh, number seven, we reject those who teach that the grace whereby we are converted to God is only a gentle advising, <laughs> as others explain it. That this is the noblest manner of working in the conversion of man. And that this manner of working, which consists in advising, is most in harmony with man's nature. How about it's most in harmony with a proud man's nature? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Vain glory, and that there's no reason why this advising grace. I've never heard this advising grace business mm. or thought about it, but pride is at the root of it. Should not be sufficient to make the man natural and spiritual. Indeed, that God does not produce the consent of the will except through this manner of advising. And with the power of the divine working, whereby it surpasses the working of Satan, consists in this, that God promises eternal, while Satan promises only temporal goods. This is altogether Pelagian and contrary to the whole scripture, which, besides this, teaches another and far more powerful the divine manner of the Holy Spirit's working in the conversion of man, as in Ezekiel. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. Yeah. We keep coming back to this, the... the Great results of regeneration. Okay, if you pick it up at eight. Okay. So we condemn those who teach that God in the regeneration of man does not use such powers of his omnipotence as potently and infallibly bend man's will to faith and conversion, but, but that all the works of grace having been a uh, but that all the works of grace having been accomplished, which God employs to convert man, may yet so resist God and the Holy Spirit when God intends man's regeneration and wills to regenerate him. And indeed that man often does so, does so resist that he prevents entirely his regeneration and that it therefore remains in man's power to be regenerated or not. For nothing, this is nothing less than the denial of all the efficiency of God's grace in our conversion and the subjecting of the working of Almighty God to the will of man, which is contrary to the apostles who teach that we believe according to the working of the strength of his power, and that God fulfills every desire of goodness and every work of faith with power, and that his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Okay. So basically what they're condemning here is the works mentality. It's on us. Even if we don't have to observe God's law to be justified, it's in our power to either accept or reject the gospel, which is really the error of John Wesley. So, so we'll accept that you're justified by faith apart from the works of the law, but it's entirely on us, whether we believe that gospel or not. We had okay. uh, Anselm in our forum who was advocating, if I understood him right, for resistible grace. Yes. And 
soon as I hear that, I hear all this other stuff floating around in the background. Um, God just trying. You know, and he argued, I think it was him, was arguing for the, or no, it was Robert Desix on Facebook. Uh, the okay. All passages mean all. And what do you do? <laughs> it's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. Um, at any rate, uh, yeah, this all involves work salvation. God tries. I call it the God is trying theory. God just wants yes. to do this. I hear that a lot. It's a, God wants to do this in your life. As soon as I hear that, I know we're dealing with a with an Arminian and a works salvation. But all that these people have to do is to direct us to the passages in Scripture that clearly and unambiguously teach all of this nonsense. Okay. But they cannot do that. What they do is they point us to scriptures that in their mind imply this doctrine. So they say, look, it's necessarily implied God so loved the world. Okay. Well, actually, it's not necessarily implied at all. But anyway, apart from that, all that I'm asking these people to do is to take us to the passages in Scripture where it is clearly, in plain words, taught that our salvation is in the power of our free wills. The fact that there are no Scriptures like that really settles the matter. One of the texts that they'll pull out, I think it's Acts 7.51, where Stephen is chiding the Israelites, your fathers, you are like the fathers who were always resisting the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Well, that doesn't mean that God was conquered by their free wills. It just means that they do what they do. All sinners by nature are resistors. The question here is God effective and effectual in his internal call. Can he conquer the, the rebel? And the answer is yes. You were once dead in your I sins and trespasses, but now you've been made alive in Christ. But when you were dead, All these, yeah. he had mercy and quickened you. Yeah. All these people have to do is to stop going to texts that seem to imply or that seem to point in a certain direction. Because every one of those texts can be contested. What we want from them is a plain passage, even one, where this entire doctrine of man's sovereign free will is clearly and plainly set up. There are no such passages in the Bible. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Now, the American Anglicans, ACNA, they don't, they don't contend for these things. Uh, they may say they hold to the 39 articles, but when push comes to shove, they've no. got Armenian heretics running around, Pelagian, even yep. up you know, charismatic guy, I remember him get, giving a Pentecostal sermon and talking about the need for a revival like they had at Azusa Street in 1906 in California. Uh, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And that's what we need today. And again, yeah. showing, you know, I think it was with you yesterday I mentioned uh and I repented earnestly this morning, big time. You know, when I approached the scriptures, kind of in a, oh, I got to get this done. And there's there's not the kind of joy that should be there. Mm. Going to hear the living true God speak directly in my ears. Mm. And then I, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Well, there's no mm. singing in that attitude. No. <laughs> You've made there's a statement one of the one of the readings at morning prayer and you made us glad you gladdened our hearts. Yes. Well, what wickedness on my part to view it as a burdensome duty that I need to get done rather than to sing and approach God's word with gladness. And so I, I did morning prayer this morning 
focusing on reading with gladness, not out of duty, not as a burden. And that was connected with the connection here is to viewing God's word as powerful, very powerful. I don't know how we got on that, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's not not viewing the word of God as sort of a duty or a chore, you know, that we have to chug through. It's 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 understanding that God has saved us by free mercy and free grace. It's what Paul is talking about. I pray that you may understand the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God. And that's the wonderful thing about the doctrines of grace is that make you feel really good. Yeah. As it says there in Article 17, the godly consideration of predestination and our election in Christ is full of sweet, pleasant, and unspeakable comfort to godly persons. Yeah, and I was reading one of the other articles on how to teach election from the canons of door. I saw it this morning. That is to be taught with humility and care and caution, not and not to be prying into the secrets of God, but simply to rest and trust in his promises. And it had that yes. cautionary angle that, that Cranmer brought in in Article 17, which some try to assert that there's only single predestination, which Cranmer was not a single predestinarian. And I have the scholars on my side on that point. But anyway, are we really expecting the article to give us a complete theology of the whole Bible? No, of course they're not. I think was it Cummins who said that um, the articles give us a minimum standard of Which includes total depravity and the bondage of the will. Yes, but Which, the point is, it's not, it's not intended ever to be a comprehensive theology of the whole Bible. Yeah, and it's not. That's why I'm not, that's why I like the Westminster Standards, which enlarge and amplify, which is what Jim Packer said. You know, he used it as an am amplification tool on the 39 articles, which he noted would disturb some of his Anglican readers. I don't know why. But... Yeah, yeah. Anyways, if you want to pick it up there at nine, we've got a few minutes left. Okay, we condemn those who teach that grace and free will are partial causes, which together work the beginning of conversion. And that grace, in order of working, does not precede the working of the will. That is, that God does not efficiently help the will of man unto conversion until the will of man moves and determines to do this. For the ancient church has long ago condemned this doctrine of the Pelagians, according to the words of the apostles. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that hath mercy. Likewise, for who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, I don't know if it was Anselman or someone else who was, maybe it was Robert Bessitz. You know, he just can't deal with Romans 9. No. Uh, so then it is not of him that will it. No. Remember uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse of 10th Presbyterian would constantly cite this verse. He was a dispensationalist, I might add, Presbyterian. He would he was a Calvinist. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Hey, that's that's as clear as can be. The same, and that's just one passage. That's not the only place in the Bible. That's just one passage. Then it goes on to talk about 
someone who complains about, you know, well, who then can complain, you know, because God has made him this way. Mm. Paul goes on and says, Nay, but oh man, who art thou? It replies against God. What if he's made one vessel, vessel of destruction, vessel of wrath, fitted for destruction? Correct. Made the other yeah. vessel of mercy. In other words, what Paul is saying there is sit down and shut up. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to say that. I've had to say that two to three times in my life when I've got pushed right back to the edge by an obnoxious person. Nay, but oh man, who art thou? Who are you compared to God? To raise up exactly. any voice to him. It is that. Exactly. Sit and be quiet and listen. Yeah. Ah, we're back. Maybe we should call it a day here. Yes. Good, good place to do that. Yeah. Okay, if you'll close us in prayer, Roger. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for continuously helping us to understand your grace, your love, and your mercy to us, and that it is entirely by your gift that we are counted as your sons and as your children, through the merits of Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who sits at your right hand, and who will return in glory to judge the living and the dead and to reveal your kingdom. And we give you thanks for this mercy through Christ, the same Christ. Amen. Amen. And I see you on Thursday. Is that correct? Yes. If we live in it, God is willing. Yes, God is willing. And by then we'll have the election results here in the U.S. It's going on today. And then in a closing note, Roger, you know, I got to read the scriptures with joy and gratitude, not as a chore. You know, that's, <laughs> my, day. that's my dose of repentance for today. <laughs> I mean, good for you. We look at the great things he's done for us. How can we not be thankful? <laughs> Heidelberg Catechism, one and two. Anyways, I'll see you on Thursday, God willing. Okay, then, Donald. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.